The Life, Love, and Leadership Podcast is a presentation of Marissa Q. Payne International, Dr. James Payne Speaks, and the Foundation for Successful Marriages with Rare Gem Productions. Learn more at SuccessfulMarriages.org. And here are your hosts, the doctor and the missus, Marissa Q. Payne and Dr. James Payne. Welcome back to Life, Love, and Leadership with Dr. James and Marissa Q. Payne. I'm Marissa Q. Payne. And I'm Dr. James Payne, and we're super excited to have you back with us for another thrilling episode of Life, Love, and Leadership. If this is your first time listening, welcome to the party. A word of advice, you'll need a notebook for this podcast because in between all the laughing, we tend to drop some real nuggets, tips, tools, resources you can use in life, love, and leadership. So grab a pen or hit the subscribe button or follow so you can come back and not miss a single tidbit. Hubby, what is the teaching topic for today? Well, today, baby, we're going to be talking about S-E-X. That's right, sex. We're going to be dealing with sex today. So you'll definitely want to stay tuned for that. Oh, my goodness. You're a preacher. Can you talk about sex? Absolutely, I can talk about sex. Absolutely. So what about it? (laughs) Well, we're going to be dealing with how to disarm sex. So often, couples have a tendency to use sex as a weapon in their relationships. And we want to disarm that because sex is not really supposed to be used as a weapon. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sex as a weapon. I see it. Yes, but, you know, before we get off into that, I'm always interested in knowing what's going on in that pretty little head of yours. (laughs) Baby, what is on your mind today? (laughs) Um, it's cold. (laughs) That's what's on my mind. (laughs) It's cold. I've been cheated out of fall. Winter is already here. And, um, I'm not too thrilled about it. Mm. I am not a winter person. Um, we went from like 60 degrees to literally record lows, Mm -hmm. like the lowest temperatures since like the 1900s. Mm. And, um... Yeah, which got me to thinking about cuffing season. Cuffing season? Yes. What in the world is cuffing season? You're not hip to cuffing season? I am not hip to cuffing season. Bae, you need to, you got to, you know, step your game up. Okay. (laughs) Well, help a brother climb. So, cuffing season is this phenomenon where um, when it gets cold or, you know, there's less outdoor activity, so people tend to be more prone to want to be in relationship. They want to get cuffed, so to speak, tied down. Um, And so, but, you know, you want to kind of avoid, well, I would want to avoid being cuffed during cuffing season because it's typically not authentic, right? People are bored. They're lonely. It's the holidays. They're Mm. desperate. Um, And then as soon as the sun come out, there goes the relationship. Okay, so you're talking about people who just looking for a warm body in the cold. (laughs) Is that what cuffing season is all about? Precisely. Okay. Um, That is, you know, you need somebody to snuggle. It's chilly season. So, you know, while it's cold, Mm -hmm. yes, let's be in a relationship. But as soon as it gets warm again and I've got more options, things to do, then I'm gone. So it's oh, not really okay. authentic. So, yeah, I didn't call that cuffing season back in the day. I would just call that my girlfriend for the next couple of weeks or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean you didn't call it? We're not talking about you. <laughs> Move on, preacher. <laughs> I'm not the preacher. You're... Wow. Okay. So... <laughs> So it's interesting because our most popular podcast to date um, was really season three, which was why is marriage so hard? Mm. And this really makes me think that, you know, we could really turn that and just say, why are relationships so hard? Mm. Um, And I think that this um, is one of those reasons, like people are not authentic, Mm. right? And when you're dating and, um, You know, like people just aren't being authentic. And I don't understand why. It's just like, can't we all just be real? Hmm. You know, and so I wanted to, I have a few sort of tips for um, my people out there, my singles out there 
to who want to avoid Being right cuffed. getting caught up in cuffing season. Okay. You know, no disrespect, like not, and it's not stereotypical. Like it's it's gender neutral, right? There are definitely men out there who are looking to be in relationships and there are women who are not thinking about being in relationships Mm -hmm. and no judgment, right? I think that if we are just honest about where we are, Mm -hmm. you know, if you want to hang with somebody and have chili, Netflix and chill, and that's what you want to do, just be honest about it. Like, don't Mm -hmm. make it seem like you're interested in me and you're not really interested. Um, You're just looking for, you know, a a warm place to snuggle tonight. You know, that's... Find somebody that wants to snuggle. That's what Tinder is for. You know? <laughs> that, that's so funny that you mentioned that. That reminds me of a, a story of a buddy of mine back in undergraduate who like had a lot of different girlfriends mm. and they all knew each other. A lot of different girlfriends? Yes. Or dating a lot of people? He was seeing a whole, but I don't know what the technical language could be. <laughs> he had a lot of girls that he was physical with. Okay. And they all knew each other. Okay. And we were all like, dude, how are you pulling this off? Mm-hmm. And he's like, the key is just to be honest with them. All mm. they really want is honesty. Okay. And so, you know, that whole thing of transparency that you mentioned, hey, I've I've seen that play out for real. Don't tell me we not we're exclusive if we're not, mm-hmm. right? And then I get to decide, mm-hmm. right? That's okay with some people and and for other people it's not. So, like I said, just be honest about it. So, I think that there are, like I said, some tips to avoid that or like some red flags. So, I think the first red flag is Um, there's like this big sense of urgency, right? If you are just meeting someone and they are just like accelerating, like pushing, pushing, pushing for, um, you know, relationship and definition Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. all of that, that's a sign that it may be kind of a cuffing season kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes women call it biological clock or whatever, but nobody really wants that amount of pressure um you know when you're just meeting somebody like have fun get to know them become friends that kind of thing Mm -hmm. is what real natural relationship development looks like Mm -hmm. so if it's just like this accelerated sense of urgency either they are in it for the wrong reasons or they are not really ready for love so to speak like we talked about last week wow um so that's a red flag Hmm. um i think holiday time is big and if you just met probably shouldn't be talking about meeting the family and going to the holiday family tradition Hmm. you know dinners and things like that another red flag Um, like I said, you just met two, three weeks ago, you know, they might be using you for, you know, the dinner. So family isn't like, Oh, when you going to settle down, whatever, Mm. whatever, like you might be being used. (laughs) Um, and again, have the conversation. It's like, go with me to this thing so they can shut up. You know, I need you to do that. If you're honest about it and they're willing to do it, fantastic. Mm. But just like pretending, you know, that you're interested and then, you know, leading them on, not okay. You want to avoid that. Um, what else? I think, you know, if you only inside, like the only time y'all hang or the only thing you do is snuggle, Mm -hmm. right? Netflix and chill. You're always inside, but you never go out. You never do anything. You don't meet friends, things like that. Sure. Another red flag, you know, you'll be broke up. The big breakup day is December 12th, Mm -hmm. like right before holiday Christmas. Right. Because you don't want to buy them nothing. I get that. (laughs) But but I have a question for you. Okay. So flu season (laughs) generally runs from about October to early April. So <laughs> what is the technical season for cuffing season? Um, that is interesting because ironically they are about the same <laughs> same time period. <laughs> Exactly. Got so it. how to avoid the flu and the cuff, ah. basically, <laughs> is what we're talking about. <laughs> got it. I got it. I got it. So um, just a few little tips, you know, um, and things to be thinking about. Like I said, I, you know, the, I think the winter blues are real. You know, I definitely try my best to do a little traveling in the winter time, get to someplace warm because, you know, it's dark and cold and that that stretch of time period is not fun. So I can understand it. 
but it's not necessarily worth compromising yourself. Mm. Um, and and like that's just like one extra thing that you have to go through or one extra piece of baggage that you have to let go of mm-hmm. um, if you f- kind of fall for it or compromise yourself. Mm. Um, and so I think that finding um, other ways, more productive ways, um, to do it. I was actually just recently challenged. We were talking about self-care mm-hmm. actually at a conference that I was at. And and I do a lot of coaching around work-life balance and things like that. And, and I was sort of going internal talking about it from my own vantage point. And one of the things in the areas that I wanted to improve in was my, you know, sort of outside of my relationship. Like we've talked about this, right? Outside of you, Mm -hmm. what's my life like, my social life? And um, the challenge was, what do I do to cultivate that? You know, so if I want to have more social life, more fun um, outside of my marriage, but I'm not doing anything about it. Right. You know, so I was like, oh, I'd like to I've always wanted to take cooking classes or dance lessons, things like that. But I don't ever do anything about it. Then I'm not really cultivating the goal that I say that I want. Hmm. So um, I think, you know, the winter time is a great time to do that, to take up new hobbies, to take up new things. And, you know, you never know in that community, there might be someone who's authentically also doing the same thing. You might make a love connection, but you're not necessarily looking for it and you find something authentic, which would be pretty cool. Mm, Got it. Got it. Yeah. And so I think the other thing that I've been thinking about is um, I pulled out the intimacy deck again because we were talking about sex. Um, and I think that another way that you sort of know, um, that you're actually dealing with something real is you have conversation, like meaningful conversation. And I love when we played this game a few weeks ago, and I thought that every week I will pull out new questions. Um, one, because I think it's interesting, but I also think like adding to, Um, the toolkit of questions that people can ask Mm. um, of new partners Mm -hmm. or people that they're dating, um, their marriage partner. I just think it's really cool. So I have some new questions for you. Well, let's get down like James Brown. All right. So first question is, what's one thing about your life that you'd never change for me or anyone else? One thing about my life that I would not change for you or anyone else. Hmm. I think the thing that comes to mind for me is my faith in God and Mm. my faith in myself. Mm. Uh, I believe in God and I believe in James Payne. (laughs) Uh, I am the chief number one fan in the fan club of James Payne and I believe in God (laughs) as well so I think my belief in God and my belief in me uh can be unwavering where did that come from I gotta go back to my mom and dad like my parents taught me that if it is done in the world you can do it like and they were serious and they can you know consistently drum that in our heads like you know why are you admiring something you can do? Go do it. Hmm. And uh, so, you know, that's just the way I was raised. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I must say it's one of the things I admire about you. It's one of the things that, that annoys me about you, too. But I mostly admire it. Because <laughs> you just think you can do anything. anything. Like, you're not scared or intimidated by anything, mm-hmm. which is pretty impressive. Yeah. How would you answer the same question? Oh, Um, I definitely agree about the faith. My faith is not for sale for anybody. Um, and I think the other thing is, um, family. Okay. Uh, my commitment to my family, Mm -hmm. um, is also pretty, you know, I'm pretty serious about my role as mom and sister and auntie. Hmm. Um, friend, even. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I value relationships, sure. I think. And so I, you know, I wouldn't allow someone to come in and um, 
come between the relationships that I value. Got it. I think that's important. Got it. Okay. What were the major turning points in your life that got you here? Major turning points in my life. uh, I think I'll point to two. The first was the birth of our uh, firstborn son. Mm. Shout out JP. Uh, That definitely called me to a level of maturity. Uh, and awareness of the need to be uh, mature and an, an adult uh, that nothing previously had done. Because mm-hmm. here this you know precious little life was depending on me for everything. And his entire existence, world, and opportunities would be framed around how I managed my life. Like, that was a lot of responsibility. You so, felt all that at 21? I had no other choice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. I did. And I I think the uh, other uh, major shift was when my dad passed. And uh, that just helped me understand that life is short. Uh, There is a brevity to life that really just, you know, makes you feel as though you have got to make the most of each day, make the most of each opportunity. And you really don't have time to waste because life is really, really short. Mm -hmm. So those were two major Uh, milestone turning points for me. What about you? Yeah, I definitely feel you on the um, death thing. You know, I lost my grandmother who was really my, you know, she was the matriarch in our family and my very best friend. Like that was my girl and I lost her at age 20. Um, So that really shifted the whole course of my life. Hmm. Um, in so many ways, one, you know, I, I basically kind of, it was like the rug got pulled out from under me. I kind of lost my foundation and, you know, the home that I grew up in and I, I had to grow up. I didn't, I didn't have a choice. I didn't have my foundation anymore. Um, I think the other thing it taught me was I got a real strong appreciation for how short life was. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I didn't, I don't take life for granted Mm -hmm. and I don't do misery. Mm -hmm. Like that is really where I learned not to stay in miserable situations. Like I don't stay in any environment that I'm not enjoying because life is too short Mm -hmm. um, for any significant amount of time. Sure. Um, Whether it's a job or relationship, like I just, I know life is short and it's not worth it to be in a situation that makes me miserable. I I really became fearless Mm -hmm. as a result of that. So that really set the course of my life. I get that. Um, Okay. Last question. What kind of present do you like the best? That's an easy one. I like tangible presents the best. Give me something that I can hold and that I can use uh, I love tangible presence um, over, I would say, experiential presence. Mm. Um, and that's just a preference. Um, though that's tangible, what I like. like? Yeah, so something I can uh, drive. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to laugh that hard. Uh, something I can drive, something uh, I can, you know, wear. Um, expensive <laughs> presents. You like expensive <laughs> presents. Don't we all? <laughs> Not necessarily, no. I mean, yes, I do like expensive presents. I do, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. duly noted. What, what about you? What about you? What kind of present do you like best? I like thoughtful presents. Mm. I like presents where, like, they are specific to me. You know, like, you had to really think about me and know me to really come up with this gift. So it's, like, not common um, or it's just like, you know, like I'm, I love popcorn, for example. So mm-hmm. like a popcorn, you know, gift. So like you have to know me to have come up with this. Yeah. So I'm, like when I go to the bank and then our bank has popcorn. Yes. And I bring you popcorn. Oh my from gosh. The bank. Yes. This big old joy. grin on my face. Yeah. I, I love because it, you had to th- be thinking about me. Um, in the normal course of the day to do that. So, um, or like one of my favorite gifts that you've given me is, um, you know, a photo blanket. Mm. So we have, you know, I love blankets. I love snuggle time, you know, (laughs) I'm on the couch. It's like my favorite place (laughs) to be. And then it's like a picture of our family, which Mm. I love from my 40th birthday party. And that's like one of my you know, prize possession. Nice, so nice. thoughtful gifts is what I like. That, my friend, is what's on my mind.
All right, so we should move on to the fight of the week. So we are going to talk about um, this week's fight of the week is really about just kind of like pet peeves Mm. that occurred during our recent travel adventures. I think a lot of our... um, quote unquote fights happen during travel. I don't know if that's because we travel a lot or if you just annoy me a lot when we travel. Interesting. It might be the latter. Well, I'm looking forward to learning more. <laughs> Please proceed. Um, but we actually made some discoveries on this trip. So what I learned is that we have a lot of different um styles when it comes to travel okay um preferences and those can like increase you know the tension between us especially if we like halt would be really important for us when we're traveling Hmm. hungry angry lonely tired um is important for us to be like rested and fed because if we're not then we can get agitated easily Hmm. Um, particularly because again, we have like very different approaches to how we do things and those little nuanced pet peeves can like, um, easily like blow up. So airport security, for example, is where it starts. Mm. I do not know why I think we've had this conversation before, but you just do airport security different. (laughs) Okay. Like right. you are less efficient than I am in less turn like efficient. Yeah, like you don't do right. Like you know what the rules are and yet somehow you are often flagged and you don't take stuff out of your pockets and it's just like So there are some things that will never be put in bins. Uh, my wallet, my boarding pass. I mean, I just carry those things. But why don't you just put it in your backpack? You don't have to put it in the bin. Just put it in your backpack. Because the backpack could get flagged. And I just like to have but that But you stand it right there. So, like, that just, I mean, it's just like you just make it more difficult than it has to be. Ah. Like, I, I don't even, and then, like, you just have to take your belt off and, like, you know, so then even when you well, get Well, you know, taking through, your belt off is part of the security program. I don't even wear a belt when I go to the airport. Because I know you got to, that's just, like, slowing down the process. But I need a belt to go with this outfit. <laughs> Wear a different outfit. (laughs) Wear sweatpants. Like, what in the world? Uh, So, it just takes so... I'm always waiting for you to get through security. mm. And then you do. You got to, zip. you know, tie up your shoes and put on your belt. Check your wallet three times and make sure that nothing... Like, it's like your OCD is just like you were not made for airport security. (laughs) So, that's number one. Most of the time, that does not bother me. I'm used to it. But I'm just saying you could be a little more efficient there. So it always starts with airport security. Interesting. Then when we get through airport security, then we got the bathroom situation. Mm. So everybody knows that when you get off the airplane, you go to the bathroom. No matter how many times we do it, when we get off the airplane, you always say, I'm going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> like, That's not common the knowledge. moment we see the bathroom, everybody knows we go into the bathroom. That's like, not every true. time not you're like, I'm going, going to the bathroom. bathroom. That's oh, not true. How, what percentage? We're going to do a poll on the site. Yeah, I'm helping you. What percentage you, like, of I'm, you I'm go you to know, the bathroom? Hey, I'm going to the restroom. But we're like walking off the gate, walking toward the bathroom. Here's the bathroom. I'm headed to the bathroom. And you're just like, I'm going to the bathroom. You are not headed to the bathroom. You're going straight. It's I'm like, like right hey, there. I'm, I'm going to the restroom. Literally 100% of the time, I go to the bathroom when I get off the plane. These are And not you do things. as well. Not so 100% of the time. Literally 100% of the time. No. I promise. I reject the data. <laughs> well, can we just say for the record right here, let's just say it right now. Can we agree? You don't ever have to tell me again <laughs> if we get off the plane that you're going to the bathroom. I know. Okay. All right? Bet. It's a deal? It's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I already know you're going to do it, but it's nice to hear it. (laughs) Pet peeve number three. (laughs) Now we're at the hotel. Mm. 
And we're checking in. So in this instance, we were early, very early. So we got in like 11, 12 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And so I'm checking in. We're done, ready to go. They have a room. Great. You want, and you say this all the time. That's right. High floor with a view. That's right. Which I think is so bizarre. I'm, I've never Why done that before. Bizarre I just take the room to... they give me. <laughs> like, what? I specified I want a king room or doubles or whatever. Like, in my reservation, I hey, told them what kind of room be, I get. Don't begrudge me because I have preferences. It never occurred to me. <laughs> like, diva. People, like, they do not know how much of a diva you are. And do this episode is going me. to vindicate. Me. Because I have preferences. So, a room is available. Mm-hmm. It is not high floor with a view. Then that's a problem. And so, you want to wait. Yes, hold my bags. I can go shopping. No way. I'm just like, uh, no. We will take the room. <laughs> it was literally, on, it was high floor, but it didn't have a view. And you were still Which like, actually we'll the view wait. turned out to be okay. Exactly. I, I wasn't upset with the view after Never. All. Ever. <laughs> That, so that's number three. Um, then when we get into the room, of course, I want to lay down. You want to go out into the streets that's immediately. Right. Um, we've already settled that, you know, whatever. Which is cool because you take your nap, do your thing. You tired, of course, from the plane. You, you need to rest. And I then don't. this is like the biggest thing is you're, you know, so in this case, I was speaking at a conference and you sort of, you know, had more flexibility by day, but you're like, oh, let's go out tonight. And I'm like, and do what? You just want to like go out, but you don't have a plan. And I am a planner. I'm just like, what are we going to do? I love a certain degree of spontaneity. So having the ability just to go out and identify what we want to do along the path. That works sometimes as well. Mm-mm. Sometimes I plan things. Sometimes I don't. Well, I can't commit to whether or not I want the to do something. The commitment is to hang out with me. Nope. That's I need the to commitment. know to do what. Because if it's to sit outside in 25 degree weather, I don't want to do that. Whether it's with you or whomever. <laughs> well, that's cold. I'm t- Exactly. <laughs> So that's a no for me. Um, And so, yes. But then when you called back and was like. No, the commitment, again, is to hang out with me. So, hey, let's go to to dinner and a show. Then I'm like, yes, absolutely. I would love to do that. You have to learn to be more spontaneous. Why? Because it's important in relationships. I mean, I'm spontaneous. I mean, who wants a scripted existence 100% of the time? Nobody wants a scripted existence. You have to learn to live in the moment. Have some freshness, mm-hmm. some spontaneity to what you do. I I can be spontaneous. No, you can't. You but are, when you're we a have a limited window of time, like two, three hours, I don't like being spontaneous in that kind of constraint because it's unproductive. Ma'am, we weren't looking for productivity at the time. <laughs> I'm just saying, Every- like, it's a waste. Like, you got this big city... There's so many options that you Let's have been to a million what we times. want to do. So it's like, why worry about, you know, scripting everything? Be Whatever. spontaneous. Yeah. So my favorite part about this whole scenario is you learn something about your ability to apologize. And I believe you have something to say to the <laughs> listeners. Oh, this is so funny. <laughs> So along this journey, I learned that I may not be a very good sorrier. Oh, did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? A little louder for the people in the back. But I'm okay with that because even Paul had a thorn in his side. (laughs) Nobody is perfect. So I may not be a very good sorrier. But I think competitively, I'm a better sorrier than you are. (laughs) So take that. But here's the thing. This is, we have had three, count them, three episodes focusing on apology. And this is the first time that you have said you're not good at apologizing. You have let three episodes on this topic go by before you actually acknowledge that it's not just me. Um, you too are actually not good at this. You mad, bro? I 
I'm just saying. <laughs> and it happened because you gave yet another one of those subjective, random apologies for something that you did or half-hearted. And I was just like, I'm going to take that before the record. It doesn't qualify. Mm. And I think you should acknowledge it to the people. So I appreciate you acknowledging that. And uh, yeah, fight of the week, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) So for today's teaching topic, we want to talk about disarming sex in relationships. Uh, Often couples use sex to exert control or to manipulate each other. Uh, And so today we want to cover four keys to disarming sex within the context of your relationship and making sure that you're not using sex as a weapon uh, and that you're not using sex in a way that really tears at the fiber of who you are uh, as a couple and your intimacy. I think it's interesting that you say disarming sex because I was, you know, I didn't really understand what you meant by that when you said it earlier, but I like hearing you say using it as a weapon mm. is brings more clarity, I think, to the conversation already for me. Mm-hmm. Um, because, like, you know, obviously if you're using it as a weapon, then what you're saying is how do you stop treating sex like, you know, mm. um, something that you use for punishment or... Um, you know, more than anything other than what it's intended for, which is, you know, good pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Something that you use for unfair advantage. Okay. Mm. And so the first thing that comes to mind for me is a lot of times sex is used uh, as manipulation. So we manipulate each other for sex and, you know, try to hold sex over the other partner's head. I'll never forget a conversation that we had very early on in our marriage. Uh, I can't even remember what you did, but you did something that was weird or crazy or whatever the case may be. I can't imagine what that would have been. And we talked about it later on, and you were like saying you were at the beauty shop, and the women told you, just give them some, girl. Everything will be all right. (laughs) Like, And that's so crazy to kind of package sex as something that you just use to get out of a jam. Mm. You know, it's very, very, very manipulative and something that you shouldn't do in the context of relationship. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, it's fu- I think it's funny that you remember that, number one. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's definitely true. It's, it's, it's not the right way to go. And I do think um, it's pretty common mm. to use... Um, you know, to use sex as, you know, like I, like you said, a prize or um, a tool to kind of, you know, give or take from as you see fit. Hmm. Um, and it's like, oh, you've been good. I'm going to give it to you. You've been bad. I'm not going to give it to you. Right. Um, which is a which is misuse for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think the second one is using sex as a punishment, mm-hmm. uh, and, and really uh, saying, "Okay, I'm going to withhold uh, sexual intimacy from my partner because I'm angry about something or I'm discontent around something." Uh, but it's not right, and we got to learn how to isolate issues and move forward in relationship. Uh, and not necessarily use sex as a weapon or something that we hold as punishment against our partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that is huge, huge, huge. You know, one of the, um, you know, it seems like one of the big things, first things to go in relationships as they deteriorate is the sex, Mm. you know, Um, that, you know, if we're not, you know, connecting, we have a disagreement, then mm-hmm. we're not having sex. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are a lot of marriages, a lot of relationships um, that are just coexisting. I agree. Um, that are have resorted to roommates, mm-hmm. right? Because they're not, there is no sex. There is no intimacy between them. Mm-hmm. Um, and this can go on for months, you know, sometimes years. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, really, really tragic. Yeah. And it's like it once you've gone that long, it's it's really number one, it's hard to get it back. 
Um, it's, it just opens you up to, you know, outside partners and it just, you know, it's like a snowball effect. Hmm. Um, and so it's really just not something that you want to get into, um, cause it, it starts with that kind of punishment hmm. mentality. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just. It's a bad idea. Yeah, I can recall years ago uh, when we were uh, really, really struggling to kind of get our rhythm in, in marriage and really kind of work on what our relationship would look like. Uh, and we were doing some counseling. I was doing some one on one counseling with a, a pastor. And one of the things he said really stuck with me. His question was, and it just seemed out of left field. He was like, are you guys uh, still having sex? And I'm kind of talking to him and we had both talked to him about things we were going through. And he's like, are you guys uh, having sex? I'm like, yeah, we're, we're still having sex. He says, OK, I asked that question because I use sex as kind of a litmus test uh, and kind of working with couples, because if you're still having sex, that says to me that there's still hope. You guys are still connecting. You haven't shut off. Uh, the the most intimate parts of yourselves to each other. There's still some form of communication, some still some form of working uh, together, and you still kind of have that feeling for each other. Uh, so he really equated that to the life of the relationship. If you're having sex, ultimately anything can be worked through. I'm not denying myself because I'm you know like <laughs> just, <laughs> I that's one thing I just I've never believed in or never done um, because it's this misnomer that sex is for men mm. um, which is not true <laughs> you know it's just as much for women as it is for men and so um, I recently heard I think it was a spoken word artist and she was talking about um, how. You know, I mean, I think we were conditioned, Christian women in particular, conditioned to protect and preserve, Mm -hmm. you know, your body and like your um, virginity is your most valuable possession and all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, this spoken word artist was saying that she gives her body freely and preserves her heart. Wow. Um, and that she doesn't let anybody into her heart that easily. Hmm. Um, and I was just like, wow, that's deep. You know, that she, her body does not represent who she is as a woman or a person. Hmm. Actually, her personality, her emotion, her soul is actually her, you know, who she is. And that is actually more valuable hmm. um, than the physicality of her body. Hmm. And I was just like, that is deep. Wow. Um, and I, I could actually appreciate that. And so, um, you know, not necessarily saying theologically, you know, this isn't a religious show or anything like that, but I, I've i just never been, um, you know, I mean, there are times, obviously, where I'm just not emotionally connected at all and I'm just not in the mood, but it's not, but there are also times when I'm mad at you, but you still look good and I'm interested, you know, and so I'm not going to deny myself. It's stupid, you mm-hmm. know, because now I'm playing games and I'm denying myself And it's childish, Hmm. you know, so and going on and connecting physically helps to bridge the gap emotionally. Hmm. Right. It opens up the door for us to be able to talk um, because we less tense. Right. And and all of that. And I I do think that that has helped us um, over the years because we haven't had these big walls and sexual tension built up um, in between us. I do think that's helpful. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, and then I think the third one is uh, sex is not one sided. And so uh, it's important that we find ways to find mutual fulfillment uh, in sexual intimacy and kind of talk to each other about your sexual desires and find ways to get to agreement and fulfillment for both partners. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, and that's. All, all sorts of ways, right? I think you you grow into that. Mm. You know, there's that speaks to the phenomenon of um, cohabitation and how, you know, a lot of people are like, I would never get married and not have had sex because mm. what if we don't connect sexually? Mm. Um, but I personally think that, um, you know, that that 
like it's not possible for you not to connect personally to someone that you have connected spiritually. Hmm. Um, well, for it's not possible for you to connect sexually to someone you have connected spiritually with hmm. um, because it's really just a matter of building the intimacy and connecting and learning each other. Um, and as long as you're both willing to, um, you know, lay aside your pride and really explore and get to know each other that eventually you're going to find the spot, you mm-hmm. know? So, um, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So, you know, having the, the courage, I know a lot of times, uh, especially men, we have a tendency to feel like, you know, we are just hitting it out of the park uh, <laughs> and that, you know, things are just absolutely incredible and amazing. But, you know, what I found personally is asking questions about the experience for you and then really working to make sure uh, that you are being fulfilled sexually when we engage uh, is something that I think heightens the experience for both of us, Mm -hmm. especially with me knowing that uh, I'm meeting your needs uh, sexually and it's just not a one-sided show. Yeah, and don't fake it, Hmm. ladies. Men, don't fake it. Like, be honest in the relationship. And you got to be able to, again, when you're connected spiritually, when you build intimacy, which is why we're talking about how to do that along with this sex conversation, um, your relationship should be able to handle a conversation, an honest conversation that says, "Mm, that didn't work for me, right? Like you said, you're not going to hit it out the box every single time, Mm -hmm. um, but you should be able to have a conversation in an intimate way that, you know, is not um, defaming of their character, that doesn't attack them and, you know, all of that TV stuff, um, but that just grows together Mm -hmm. um, and improves over time. Yeah. And then the last leg of this stool is just making sure that you're not measuring performance against past lovers. Mm. Uh, Tim ain't Jim and Sue ain't you. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and really just making sure that you're being present where you are, uh, enjoying where you are with whom you are with uh, and not, you know, comparing notes and, and whatnot, uh, because that's not healthy. It never leads to anything good. I love it. So today's question of the week How do you peaceably handle situations when a person is apologizing out of appeasement versus remorse? Mm, Interesting. Um, So my first question back would be, how do you know they're apologizing um, just to appease versus remorse? Hmm. Um, Which I, you know, of course I understand that. So I'm assuming you know, you feel like the person isn't really sorry or and they're just saying it, you know, to get you off their back, so to speak, mm-hmm. which I think is is can be pretty common. Um, so, you know, the question is, how do you know that or what is making you feel that way? And I think the way you handle it is to um you know, ask about those particular behaviors Mm -hmm. or what, you know, what, what you're observing that makes it seem like, you know, they're not really sincere. Sure. Um, And I love your question saying, how do you do it peacefully? Yeah. Um, And I, I think that, you know, we have this formula that we call the assertive communication formula. Um, And it's, you know, it's assertive, um, which means it's not passive and it's not aggressive. Right. So it is um, proactive um, and, you know, in your favor. But, you know, it doesn't use either of those extremes in terms of communication um, where you take ownership of your feelings, um, your thoughts um, and you advocate, you know, you you say what you observe Um, and advocate for what you actually need or want. Mm -hmm. So um, it would go something like, you know, when you um, fold your arms and say, I'm sorry, looking off into the distance, right? You want to say the behavior that you actually observe, not Mm -hmm. necessarily your judgment about it. But again, what was it about how they said, I'm sorry, that you felt wasn't sincere. Hmm. So say that um, I felt hurt 
or suspicious that um, because it didn't feel sincere. I realize that that may not have been the case. Um, I'm curious to know if that's true or not. Um, And what I really need is for you to understand me and um, to, you know, make a change um, in this situation. Right. Mm -hmm. So really, like I said, owning your experience, owning that you could have gotten it wrong, seeking clarity and most importantly, um, speaking to what it is you actually need or desire. Hmm. Um, yeah. Wow. Wow. No, that's a great response uh, because essentially it just leads back to having a conversation, mm-hmm. uh, seeking clarity. So without clarity, you're really kind of just mind reading. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you are uh, the experience is just kind of being vetted through uh, your filter. But when you seek clarity in an assertive way, uh, not making accusation, but really being clear about how the behavior makes you feel uh, and then walking through that feeling with the person of how this makes you feel to get clarity on whether or not that is really what the uh, intent was or whatever the case may be. Uh, I, I think that conversation has to be there. That's the only way to get beyond mind reading. Because, again, it, it could be remorseful. It may not be appeasement. We don't know really without the conversation. And so that assertive communication is really the end all be all. Hope that helps. Yes. Thank you so much for the question. This is Life, Love, and Leadership. The Life, Love, and Leadership podcast is a presentation of Marissa Q. Payne International, Dr. James Payne Speaks, and the Foundation for Successful Marriages. Connect with us. Find us and follow on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to learn more about our guests, show notes, services, events, or to get involved. Visit SuccessfulMarriages.org. Life, Love, and Leadership is another positive production of Rare Gem Productions. Thanks for listening.